Hello, everybody. You are listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. I'm Joan. And we are back with our first news episode of the year, sort of. Of course, we <laughs> released one recently, but um, that was kind of going over news of the previous year. So this is our first episode of the year covering news from this year, uh, January 2024. Uh, yeah, I guess... Uh, that went by pretty quickly, it seems. Uh, it's already been more than a month into this new year. There have been a lot of exciting findings, I think. But um, I guess before we get into it, uh, how have you been doing? The world could have been better. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, the year started off pretty fine. And then, come February time, I got COVID. Mm. So, I've been sick and bedridden for a little less than two weeks but thankfully I've, i'm kind of at the recovery stage now where all the bad symptoms are kind of going down thankfully i didn't get it too rough um a bad cough and stuffy nose you know that kind of thing right but uh, it's definitely not fun and it certainly serves as a stark reminder that the pandemic is still not over even mm -hmm. though it's been like four years and viruses being kind of living things uh evolve over time and so there are new strains that are going to do different things for people yep and so it's always important to stay vigilant and protect yourself as best as you can and protect others as best as you can because obviously it affects people of different ages different levels of severity than if you're young and sometimes not sometimes it's the reverse it's a it's a strange it's a strange illness that's for sure uh, and so i haven't been able to do very much since the last time we met um, it's only by you know good fortune that i'm able to talk the way i can without coughing a bunch mm. that we've been able to do this episode today um well, i've been able to catch up on some things um I used a lot of the time while I was resting uh, to read a very wonderful world history uh, by Simon Montefiore, uh, The World of Family History of Humanity, uh, which came out uh, late last year, uh, which means that it's very up to date. Um, it's been able to include the, the start of the COVID pandemic and the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, for mm. example. So it's very like up to the minute. Um, and it was a very fascinating read because different uh, historians write world histories in different ways with different focuses. So this one was, as the subtitle suggests, it focuses on family lines through time, uh, tracking uh, dynastic successions and, and family trees over the ages with a big emphasis on families in power, kings and emperors and presidents, uh, for example. And so it's very interesting doing it that way because you see a lot of connections between countries and families and how different families in power knew each other and liked each other or despised each other. Mm -hmm. um, the book is definitely very blunt in describing all of the atrocities and violence that these families bestowed upon each other and on their citizens. So it's, uh, it's very uh, raw in that sense, but it also demonstrates a lot of the ingenuities of the human species and of various you know inventors and purveyors of good throughout time so i think it's a pretty well balanced account and it's very dense too it's 1262 pages so it's a cinder block of a book so you better believe while i was resting i was getting through like 100 pages a day with this <laughs> thing it just kept going and going but it, it's it's a rewarding read <laughs> so i definitely encourage anybody who's interested in that sort of thing to look in on it. Um, and let me think. I watched a bunch of shows as well. I uh, I finally got to see David Attenborough and the Jurassic Sea Monster. Um, so and PBS often airs a lot of BBC shows on that. Format. So this is the American version of that series where there was a recent discovery of a giant pliosaur skull in the UK, right. on the side of a cliff, um, the famous Jurassic Coast, um, and 
oh my god, a beautiful specimen that they ended up recovering. It was like a six foot skull. It had all the teeth embedded in it. And uh, they were able to get like CT scans to show blood vessels and brain anatomy. Um, so it, it's like one of the most complete pliosaur skulls that have ever been found. So I think in the coming years, as this material is published, um, it's going to provide some very nice insights into pliosaur biology. Um, so I'm yeah. very happy to see that. And of course, even at 97 Attenborough, it's still very much enthusiastic about <laughs> fossils. <laughs> it was nice to see his, um, his like, schoolboy-like glee as mm -hmm. he looking at the skull and recounting his childhood of collecting <laughs> fossils on the coast. So, all in all, like, even though I was sick, I was still able to keep up with natural history events. And uh, that's pretty much been what I've been up to. What about you, buddy? <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, I'm sorry that you got COVID. Like, yeah, I mean, as some listeners might recall, I ended up getting it for the first time last year i was at the uh, society of avian paleontology and evolution conference which was otherwise very fun but yeah i really paid a hefty price for that um getting sick after coming back from the conference was definitely like a, uh decidedly not fun and so it's definitely not an experience i would ever want to repeat again or wish upon anyone and so yeah it's really unfortunate that you ended up getting it this time around um but uh, I'm glad you're feeling much better now, and uh, glad you got to catch up on so much as well. Um, as for me, I don't have too much to update uh, since we last recorded, I think, um, at least in terms of things that are relevant uh, to the show. Um, I've been, I would say, working pretty hard <laughs> on research-related things. I, I know I constantly say that, but um, yeah, that, that's how it is sometimes. <laughs> um, and I, I'm making pretty good progress overall. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy, I think, with, uh, with where I'm at now. Uh, so a lot of these projects that I've been working on for a long time um, are coming along nicely and are approaching a state where they're um, getting you know, towards completion. So I am quite excited to eventually actually bring them over the finish line. And then we'll, we'll see what uh, can be said about that uh, when the time comes. So we have our... Uh... A regular news episode this time um it's going to be just the basics right albert and i are going to cover two stories from past month january 2024 and of course there was uh again it's always a, a little bit of a struggle to pick <laughs> yeah. the right stories because there are so many neat papers that we could talk about and share mm -hmm. but we think that the selection that we picked is pretty good and so we're going to share those first. Yeah. If we move to the next slide, we actually have some follow-up chain. Now, uh, for this first paper here, uh, we have follow-up from the immediate preceding episode of all <laughs> things, our, our 2023 roundup. <laughs> yep. Um, so for uh, my December story, I discussed the findings of uh, Jinshi Liu and colleagues who described a number of fossils from the uh, Chuanlingu formation of North China. But these fossils were particularly important for the field of paleontology because they consisted of a number of macroscopic algae that had seemingly already diversified quite a bit by the late Paleoproterozoic era. So the, the, local, the formation dates to about 1.65 billion years ago. That's what it would be a long time ago. Oh, and much earlier than was originally understood for the evolution of uh, multicellular eukaryotic life. Now, that paper described seven species in five genera, but earlier last month, we were graced with yet another paper about this formation. And this time, it was describing new specimens of just one species, a Chingshania magnifica. So this is another macroscopic algae. What's curious is that this paper, which is by uh, Lan Yun Yao and colleagues, was not co-authored by any of the scientists in the earlier paper, 
And in fact, this one doesn't seem to reference it at all. Believe me, I checked. <laughs> so I can only guess that the two papers were being worked on simultaneously by two different teams. Right. And then one got released first and the other one got released later. But uh, regardless, what makes Meow et al.'s paper so interesting is that the team were able to make some more specific identification for these uh, then little known fossils of Qingshania, which had been previously unearthed in the 80s. So chemical analysis showed that these were not cyanobacteria, but a type of eukaryotic algae that has a, a nucleus that contains the DNA uh, that reproduced with asexual spores and underwent an intracellular differentiation as it grew, meaning that as the cells grew, they would become different structures within the algae. There are some anatomical similarities that most closely ally these fossils with the green algae, or chlorophytes, uh, and with the brown algae, or aquifers. But classification within either groups does not seem to be feasible at this time. We just don't have enough information to make any definitive uh, placements in phylogeny. But the presence of cell walls does suggest that Qingshania may have been using photosynthesis with plastids, hmm. that is, it had already undergone endosymbiosis, where a larger ancestral eukaryotic cell enveloped uh, a photosynthesizing bacteria, and rather than destroy the cell as it ate it, it kept it inside its body and helps provide energy. Uh, and that's important because it would push back the origins of endosymbiosis even further into the late Paleoproterozoic, uh, again, within an environment that was previously understood to have not been conducive to such large macroscopic organisms. And so it was nice to see that this paper, because it underscores the importance of the diversification of life so early in the Precambrian, and it really kind of reframes our focus about how easy it is for macroscopic organisms to evolve in the first place, mm -hmm. especially ones with a multicellular range. So I wanted to definitely share that follow-up. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add about this one? Not in particular, uh, but uh, it is cool to see more fossils coming out of the site and kind of uh, confirming the diversity of multicellular life there. Uh, I, I'm sure many more interesting discoveries will be coming from this uh, in the future. Yeah, and it was interesting to see that it had two different teams working on the fossils. Um, so, but hey, it's cool. I mean, I guess that means that there's plenty for everyone <laughs> <laughs> in that site. Now, um, the next follow-up story is a new detail in the story of North American jaguars, which we covered in the special discussion back during our July 2022 episode. Mm. To briefly summarize that, there seems to be a multitude of evidence from paleontology, indigenous oral traditions, and European colonial records that show that jaguars used to be fairly widespread in North America, north of Mexico, until fairly recent times, California to the southwest to the Appalachians, which uh, is a concept that still rattles my brain to this day. So this December 2023 paper by Mega Sregan and colleagues, looks at paleontological evidence. Now, fossils of particularly large jaguars had been unearthed at various late Pleistocene sites within the southern United States, averaging 15 to 20 percent larger than living jaguars, or an estimated 85 to 120 kilograms, and also having slightly different bodily proportions. And this has led to two competing models to explain these animals. One is that they're a subspecies of jag, which would be known as Panthera onca augusta, or that they may even be their own species, which would make them Panthera augusta, and would be only closely related to jag. So Sreegan et al.'s paper managed to extract ancient DNA from one of these giant jaguar fossils. And this one specifically came from the Kingston Saltpeter Cave in Bardo County, Georgia. 
and compared it to jaguars from across the Americas, including the remaining species in Mexico, which is currently among the northernmost range for jaguars nowadays. Uh, it turns out that neither model seems to be correct. <laughs> the genome of the giant jaguars fell right within the genetic diversity of living jaguars. It seems that these cats represent a distinct dispersal event into northern North America that had established itself between 420 and 370,000 years ago, and so became specialized. Uh, so we would need more fossils of jaguars from across the United States to truly understand the intricacies of their evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, for it may be that maybe the story is a bit more complex than this. Maybe jaguars settled this region multiple times in the Pleistocene, and some of these survived to the present day, while others died out. So I thought that this was really nice to see. Um, it's always cool to clarify some of these classifications that have only been established with fossil remains, which underscores the importance of ancient DNA to the study of fossil organisms as a supplement. Mm -hmm. uh, so did you have anything you wanted to add about this paper? Not really. Um, but uh, no, this is obviously very cool to see, and we've definitely talked about um, how insights from ancient DNA have really helped us understand um, kind of the evolution of recent animals in recent times uh, quite a lot. And uh, this seems like a very good example of that. It really reminds me of an essay that I read by Stephen Jake in one of his book collections of essays when he worked for um, uh, Natural History. And he was talking about kind of the, the pros and cons of using subspecies to understand biological diversity. And this seems to be one of those cons where in the absence of genetics, you have fossils of related organisms and they might show enough differences between each other that you could say, oh, well, maybe this is a subspecies and this is a subspecies and maybe they separated from each other at a certain point in time. But when you incorporate the ancient DNA into these sorts of studies, like what has been done here, and you reveal that things are a little more complicated than that, and that it's really just an instance of regional variation following a singular dispersal in the distant past, um, it really makes you wonder how many of these subspecies that have been named over time are really valid or not. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I know this has happened with living animals, too, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, with uh, grizzly bears, or I should say brown bears. Um, uh, biologists used to recognize like 40 something <laughs> subspecies of brown bears. But I think now that that's, that's been lowered down to like five or six. Mm -hmm. uh, and then tigers underwent the same thing, too. There used to be like five, six, seven, like eight subspecies. And now that we really understand their genetics, it seems that all of that diversity can be kind of siphoned into just two. And within those two subspecies, there's just a lot of regional variation that changes as you go across regions and as populations are split from each other, small periods of time. So it's neat to see similar instances happening in the fossil record. And uh, I'm hoping that we can kind of solve more um, paleontological mysteries in this way. Like, I understand there's still discourse about the deep history of lions, right? Like, yeah. what is the American lion? Mm -hmm. What are the European cave lions? Are they their own species or do they fall within the variation of surviving lions today? I'd really be interested to know that sort of thing. And at least we have a means to test it. Uh, provided the ancient DNA has survived long enough to do it in the first place. We have with this fossil, um, this particular Georgian jaguar is about 15,000 years old. Uh, it's just enough time for the DNA to survive to an extent. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I thought these follow-up studies were important to share. Um, it, it always underscores the importance uh, of understanding that 
science is always ongoing, mm -hmm. and there's never usually a last word <laughs> on a given topic. There's always something new to discover and to clarify for that matter. Mm -hmm. And so with that, that's the end of our follow-ups. Um, Albert, I do believe you have first dibs on our first January story. Yeah, uh, let's go to the next slide and start with our uh, kind of main news stories. Um, and so for my first news story, we are going to cover a pretty exciting new fossil of what is called a stem ketonate. Uh, so I think before we actually get to the fossil part, we should probably explain what a ketonate is. Ketonates are a group of animals that are still alive today. It is said that one of their common names is the arrow worms. Uh, however, as is the case oftentimes with these obscure animal groups, you have to wonder just how commonly used some of these quote-unquote common names are, because I feel like if you know what ketonates are, you're probably more likely to just call them ketonates <laughs> and not arrow worms. But uh, okay, anyways, that's what all the books say that their common name is. Um, and they live in the ocean. Uh, so yeah, as far as I'm aware, at least, they're pretty much all marine. Um, and they're very small animals. So uh, they range in size from a little longer than a millimeter uh, to over 100 millimeters, which would be 10 centimeters long. So uh, yeah, very small animals. And most species seem to spend the majority of time um, in the water column. So they're actually like swimming around uh, slash floating around in the water. Um, now, partly because they're very small, um, they can't actually swim against the current of the water. So even though they are able to swim by kind of wiggling their, their bodies around, um, they're also kind of drifting at the whim of the current. So they're essentially, they can be considered a type of plankton. Um, so plankton is essentially a term for any kind of you know, aquatic life form that's just drifting around in the water. They're not like actively swimming against the current. Now, as for what ketonates look like, uh, I put up a few pictures here. Uh, so on the left, the image on the left there, uh, you can see what the entire body looks like. For most part, their bodies tend to be transparent. So they don't have a lot of pigmentation in them. Along their sides and the kind of the tail, I suppose you could say, you might be able to make out um, that they have a bit of a fin like going around their bodies, uh, which is what they use to swim with. And so the majority of them, they're basically plankton that can still kind of move around by themselves. So they're not completely passively just like sitting around in the water, but they're still like subject to the flow of the current. Uh, however, there are some other species that attach to substrates like rocks um, or even sand grains on the seafloor. Um, so they do have a bit of a range in their lifestyles. Um, in terms of what their role in the ecosystem is. Uh, ketonates are actually a type of predatory um, animal, even though they are very small. Um, and the way they catch their prey, you can see um, in the image on the right here, this is a close-up of the head, basically, of a ketonate. And you can see that surrounding like either side of their head, they have these sets of spines that they use to capture their prey. Uh, and furthermore, uh, it is known that at least some species have venom uh, that they can inject into their prey. And so, yeah, they are very effective predators at the micro scale. Um, and uh, they hunt all kinds of other types of plankton. They hunt things like tiny crustaceans, even very small fish, like a lot of juvenile fish actually spend you know, their, their days growing up as plankton before they, they grow large enough to actually swim around more actively. Um, but uh, oftentimes these uh, small larval fish have to watch out for ketonates, among other things. Um, even though ketonates are a very obscure group to most people, most people haven't heard of them, they're actually a really major component of oceanic ecosystems. Um, in terms of their, uh, their abundance as plankton, they are second only to the copepod crustaceans, which we talked a little bit about uh, in a few episodes ago uh, when we were talking about crustacean phylogeny. Copepods are one of the groups of crustaceans that form a large component of uh, marine plankton. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, copepods, well, 
the character Plankton from SpongeBob SquarePants is actually based on a copepod. Of course, he's very stylized. But um, a lot of his features, like, for example, having a single eye in the center of his body are, are features that actual copepods have. Um, so he can actually tell that he's a copepod, even though he's very cartoonishly drawn. Um, but yes, yeah, so the keto, keto nates are, uh, like, second only to them. So they're, they're incredibly abundant uh, and kind of not only major predators at that scale, but also uh, being so small, they end up feeding a lot of animals um, that are bigger than them as well. So they're also a major prey item. Um, for various types of fish, for example, uh, including some that are very economically important to us. Uh, so things like uh, mackerel and herring, they actually feed a lot on uh, ketonates. Um, in terms of what kind of animal ketonates actually are, uh, it turns out uh, that has been really tricky for us to determine, historically speaking. Um, if you think about uh, bilateral animals, so animals that can that have body plans that you can divide into a left and a right uh, s symmetrically. Uh, so basically most animals other than sponges and comb jellies and cnidarians, which include jellyfish and sea anemones. Um, so like all, all of those um, things that we just mentioned, they don't have left-right symmetry, right? Um, but uh, most other types of animals do. And so bilateral animals or bilaterians, including us and including ketonates, can mostly be divided into two major groups. Um, and so one of these groups, the one that we belong to, uh, is called the deuterostomes. And ancestrally, when we develop uh, as embryos, uh, basically the opening for the anus develops first before the mouth develops. And so like the group that we belong to are kind of uh, butt first um, developers, essentially. Um, and so in addition to uh, us vertebrates, the uh, deuterostomes also include things like the echinoderms, uh, which are things like starfish, sea cucumbers, and sea urchins. Um, and ketonates, uh, developmentally, uh, resemble deuterostomes. So traditionally, they have been considered to be deuterostomes. But genetic studies have shown that they actually belong to the other big group of bilateral animals. And those are the ones that develop mouth first, um, and they're called the protostomes. So in fact, the name protostome means uh, first mouth, essentially, um, whereas deuterostome means like, second mouth, so the, the mouth develops after the butt. Um, but uh, protostomes, the mouth develops first, and in fact, protostomes are a much more diverse group than deuterostomes are. Uh, protostomes include things like arthropods, which, as we've mentioned before, are most animals on Earth. Um, they also include things like the mollusks, which are also a very big group. Um, and they also include things like the segmented worms, such as earthworms, uh, the flatworms, um, and a bunch of other things. And it turns out that ketonates are actually a group of protostomes, even though they have development that resembles deuterostomes. But their position within the protostomes has not been easy to figure out either. Uh, however, current genetic studies, from what I've been able to find, uh, seem to suggest that they are closely related to various other uh, tiny aquatic animals uh, in a group called Nathiferra. Um, and something that characterizes um, Nathiferans are that they, they all have like these complex uh, mouth parts made of chitin. So they, they're not always, uh, you know, like these spiny looking uh, things like the ketonates have. Uh, a lot of the time they're mostly internal actually, so uh, you might not be able to see them from the outside, but uh, they, do, they do all share uh, this trait. And so that seems to be the latest word on ketonate relations, um, and it makes sense to me, uh, but we'll, we'll see how that holds up, because there, there's actually still a lot of uncertainty within uh, protostome uh, phylogeny. Um, so that's a very, very basic intro to what ketonates are, and with that, we can finally go on to uh, introduce our new fossil form, uh, that is the new discovery of this story. And so, uh, this new fossil uh, comes from the early Cambrian of Greenland, uh, quite interestingly. Uh, and if you're interested in evolutionary biology at all, chances are you have heard of the Cambrian period, because this is the period where we basically start finding a lot of fossils of large-bodied animals. Um, and uh, so traditionally, has been, there's been the term Cambrian explosion that's been used to, to describe this phenomenon. That suddenly you just get like this bunch of, a bunch of animal fossils, and from there on out, animal fossils become kind of a major component of the fossil record. Um, 
And there's been a lot of debate as to what caused the Cambrian explosion and, uh, or even like if it's a real phenomenon in the first place or are we just seeing um, like, you know, an increase in fossilizability of animals and not so much an actual increase in the diversity of animals. Um, it's a very interesting topic. We don't have time to go into that today. Uh, but uh, yes, this is another exciting new discovery um, coming from the Cambrian. Um, one of the things about the Cambrian fossils is that because they are kind of, in many cases, the earliest fossils of uh, major groups of animals that we have, uh, they can teach us a lot about what the um, ancestral forms of many major animal groups were like. We have a pretty good understanding, for example, of uh, what the precursors to arthropods were like, or the precursors to vertebrates, um, based on uh, Cambrian fossils. Uh, but there are a number of uh, major animal groups that still have not um, been very well understood in terms of what their ancestral body plans were like. Uh, and partly that's because a lot of time we haven't identified their uh, Cambrian precursors yet. And ketonates are one of those groups that whose origins have been relatively obscure. Um, so this, uh, this new find is actually a pretty big deal indeed in more of the ways than one. Um, so this new find um, that you can see on the uh, left here uh, is uh, is an example of one specimen of this new species, um, and it may not look like too much <laughs> uh, to the untrained eye. It looks just like a bit of smear on a, on a rock, um, but the authors have um, described multiple specimens of this animal, um, and so they have a pretty consistent picture of what its anatomy was like. In addition to examining these specimens uh, with the naked eye, they also kind of put the specimens under all kinds of different lighting conditions to kind of get a sense of what uh, the details looked like. Um, and they also basically shot x-rays at it, uh, which can also, which can often highlight um, parts of the uh, specimen, like depending on their chemical composition uh, with these uh, fossils of soft-bodied animals, um, like different uh, body parts will like reflect like different uh, chemical compositions um, after they're preserved. And so uh, sometimes I can help you distinguish like which organs are where on these like very difficult to interpret specimens. And so these newly found um, fossils um, exhibit these fins along the sides of their body. And uh, you can kind of see an interpretive drawing in the middle here, as well as like a, a more detailed kind of um, illustrations of the anatomy um, that the authors were able to determine from the fossils. And so you can see that surrounding the body, uh, there are these uh, fins. Um, so this animal seems to have been an active swimmer. Um, at the head end, you can see that they have a pair of antennae, essentially. Um, and inside the body, uh, highlighted in black uh, on these illustrations, um, there, this animal has a complex jaw apparatus, uh, a lot like uh, natheferins today. So this seems to have been a natheferin. Um, and specifically, uh, what makes it quite ketonate-like are, well, first of all, the fins around the body, uh, but also uh, the authors were able, able to identify that it has like these this pair of large nerve clusters near the underside of this body, which is highlighted in blue on these illustrations. Um, and so having a pair of large nerve clusters like this um, on the underside of the body is something that's basically unique to ketonates among modern animals. And so these features combined suggest that uh, this newly discovered fossil is a member of the Natifera and probably most closely related to ketonates. And indeed, when the authors ran a phylogenetic analysis, including these um, character traits, um, uh, their results supported this hypothesis that, yeah, this was a stem ketonate, which is to say that it is uh, not a member of the modern ketonate group, and it certainly lacks a lot of the features that modern ketonates have, like the big spiny jaws, for example. Um, but it is more closely related to ketonates than to any other living group of organisms. Um, and in fact, uh, this is not the first uh, stem ketonate to have been identified. Uh, the overall body plan that this animal exhibits is similar to another species, um, or another genus, I should say, called Amesquia uh, from the uh, Cambrian of Canada, from the famous uh, Burgess Shale. Um, these two species have very similar body plans, uh, but uh, the new one is actually much bigger. Uh, so Amesquia is within the same size range as modern ketonates, uh, whereas this new fossil uh, is up to 30 centimeters long. Remember, 
modern heater nates, the biggest ones are about 10 centimeters long, uh, whereas this one is like a foot long. So uh, this is much, much bigger than a modern uh, keto nate. Probably inspired by this, uh, the authors named this new fossil uh, Timore bestia, which means the dreaded beast. And yeah, I mean, uh, 30 centimeters um, in the Cambrian, this would have been one of the biggest animals around. And indeed, it likely was one of the apex predators of its ecosystem. Um, so this paints a very interesting picture of Cambrian ecosystems, at least early Cambrian ecosystems, and which seems to be that, uh, at least in some places, stem ketonates were some of the top predators. And uh, that's very different from modern day, right? Where ketonates are, they're predatory, but they're very small animals that still get eaten by a lot of other things too. Definitely a very interesting and unexpected type of ecosystem dynamic. Uh, the fact that Timora bestia was a dreaded predator um, actually is not only inferred from the fact that, that it is massive and is a stem ketonate, but there is direct evidence of this in the fossils, because in multiple specimens of this animal, um, the authors were able to identify remains of other types of animals as gut contents, like preserved inside the body of Timora bestia, um, namely uh, remains of a Cambrian arthropod called Isoxes, which is, uh, yeah, quite, quite interesting. So Isoxes is, um, um, also seems to have been a predatory arthropod, um, but uh, it, was, it was quite a bit smaller than uh, Timora bestia, so it would have had, um, had to watch out for it, essentially. Um, so yeah, quite, the, quite an unexpected find. Uh, not only is this one of the few examples of uh, stem ketonates that we now have, um, but also uh, demonstrates that stem ketonates at one point uh, were some of the largest predators around on Earth's ecosystems. Um, and probably later in the Cambrian, well, in fact, actually contemporaneous with, uh, with Timora bestia, we do have um, some types of stem arthropods that were also very large predators. Um, so things that are similar to Anomalocaris, which you might have heard of if you're interested in Cambrian life. Um, a very, very strange a stem arthropod with, with like these big grasping appendages at the front of its face. Um, so uh, probably the role of apex predator was gradually taken over by stem arthropods um, later in the Cambrian. Uh, but at least during the early Cambrian, uh, stem ketonates were still some of the major uh, players. Um, something that is that was not mentioned in this paper, uh, but I think is very interesting that I've seen other people discussing this paper bring up, um, is that there is this other enigmatic Cambrian animal called Nectocaris. Um, and Nectocaris is a very, very weird creature. Uh, it's also a soft-bodied animal. Um, and uh, it also seems to have these uh, fins around the sides of its body that it was using for swimming. Um, and it has a pair of appendages um, at the front of its face uh, that, well, I would say look a little bit like tentacles. Um, and one of the interpretations of what Nectocaris is um, in relatively recent times is that maybe it was a very early member of the cephalopods, so a group of mollusks that includes things like squids and octopuses. Um, but a lot of other paleontologists have issues with this interpretation. Uh, first of all, Nectocaris is much older than the oldest known fossils, like the oldest confirmed fossils that we have of cephalopods. And secondly, um, a completely soft-bodied acephalopod would be completely unexpected for like a, such an early member of the group because being mollusks, um, cephalopods evolved from ancestors that had shells. One group of modern cephalopods still has a shell, and that's the nautiluses. Um, and we know from the fossil record that there used to be a massive diversity of extinct shelled cephalopods kind of leading up to the modern forms. Um, and so you have like this very earliest supposed cephalopod that just doesn't have a shell at all, it just does not um, really fit in with what we expect of their evolutionary origins. Um, and so many people are very skeptical of the um, interpretation of Nectocaris as a cephalopod. Um, however, Nectocaris does bear a resemblance to things like Timora bestia and Amesquia. So uh, one has to wonder whether Nectocaris is actually something similar or closely related to one of these beasts over here instead of being a cephalopod. Mm. And 
um, you know, I, again, like this is not directly mentioned in the paper, so I wouldn't want to um, overextend. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that seems like something that would be worth looking into in future studies. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Um, so this new uh, dreaded beast stem ketonate that is, uh, that is just this massive Cambrian predator is uh, definitely a pretty exciting find, I would say. Um, do you have anything to add to this? It's an incredible fossil. Fossils, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting to see an animal of this size so closely related to um, the living ketonates. Right. It really makes me wonder if the sort of planktonic nature of that group is a recent development mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. And that the group just kind of got smaller over time to give us the living ketonates. Right. I'd be very interested to know that because yeah. uh, in my cursory research like about this paper, this is a fascinating paper, um, I have I do know that there are like other fossil um, ketonates, mm -hmm. like true ketonates, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. crown ketonates. Um, that granted, we don't have like a smorgasbord. We've <laughs> right. got a, a couple here and there, but like they are present um, from the Cambrian and uh, from the the later Carboniferous, mm -hmm. which is interesting to know. I had no idea that um, a misquia was allied with this group. Yeah, um, yeah, that that was also a. A pretty recent uh, reinterpretation as well, yeah. As uh, I, that was an animal that I kind of grew up with a little bit. Right. I, uh, you know, looking at scenes of the uh, the Burgess Shale and seeing these little like tadpole, wormy <laughs> things swimming around, like that's a cool looking animal. Yeah. And now I have some context for them. That's really <laughs> neat. Um, yeah. No, this uh, I'm I'm very happy to see this, and it, I, I think it's important to kind of highlight. Uh, a clearly like mysterious group of animals because even among living uh nathaferans like there are still recent discoveries that are shedding light on this group that mm. we had not really suspected um i know one of these nathaferans uh the the micro nathazoa yeah. <laughs> only described in the year 2000 right that's like its own it's a poor term, but its own phylum, right. if you will, of animal life. It's like it's amazing that even in recent decades, we're finding like completely new types of animals yeah. that we had never known about. And it, of course, a lot of these naturally, like we probably wouldn't have found them readily because they're small, they're microscopic, they're they're part of the plankton, um, and yet here they are allied to this other group here that's a lot more well known and more familiar. Mm -hmm. Certainly, with with ketonates and their ancestors, having hard parts would make them a little bit more susceptible to fossilization than others. It, it really makes me wonder if we didn't have ketonates today, and we found their their little tiny teeth, <laughs> like would we come up right. with a ketin? Right. You know. Yeah. Because I know there's a similar controversy with an animal called Protohertzina. Hmm which uh, has been interpreted as a conodont, which um, conodonts are another one of these enigmatic fossil groups that we've learned more about in recent years. Yep. We're a little more confident about what their classification is. They're essentially like jawless fishes. Mm -hmm. like, they're, they're sort of like hagfish and lampreys. Right. They, they, they have long bodies with really like toothy mouth parts, probably predators. And so Protohertzina, which is early Cambrian in age, um, was thought to be one of these. But now I'm understanding this research that suggests that they might actually be like a type of ketonate. Hmm. Um, and again, all we have of protohertzina are these tooth elements. Right. So unless we find, uh, you know, full bodies, um, fossils of these animals, um, that definitely seems like a, uh, a mystery that's going to remain with us for some time. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, gosh, what what a treat to see such a well-preserved group of fossils to mm. where we're getting, like, the internal anatomy of these animals. Yeah. Mm. That, that's amazing to me. Um, granted, I know a lot of the uh, Burgess Shale and, and, and uh, other formations of the Cambrian fauna have almost, like, a dissection-like quality to these remains. Right. Where, like, you can really piece together the development of the internal anatomy of 
such early animals too, especially as forerunners of the modern lineages today that we're so familiar with. We can understand like where the arthropod body plant came from and the mollusk body plant. In this case, the ketonate body plant. Um, I'm really happy to see this. This is a great paper. Um, so Timor Bestia, that's a cool name yeah. too. I, uh, <laughs> as soon as you mentioned the nominal caris, I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if the carnivore forms got to these guys. Yeah, <laughs> right. Timor Bestia, a nominal caris. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It would be a battle for the ages. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of battles, I think we can move on now to our next story. Uh, so this is my first story for January. Uh, this paper comes from Nicole Lopez, Jonathan Moore Tupas, and, the and Theodore Stankiewicz. This is a three-author paper. So in evolutionary biology... We understand that natural selection and sexual selection often work side by side, whereby nature selects the genes that best survive from the mating contests between organisms. Those that are able to compete with rivals of their sex often develop display structures that win the attention of the mates. And oftentimes it's the males of the species who end up developing somewhat elaborate displays in the form of colorful feathers, horns, skin flaps, you name it. One aspect of this is the apparent relationship between the size of the brain and the size of the display structures. Multiple studies suggest that in the evolution of larger brains, the energy needed to develop and maintain such structures will be siphoned off from the development of other anatomical structures or even their own uh, physiology. Likewise, in the evolution of larger display or defensive structures like horns, the energy needed for them may be siphoned off from the development of the brain, leading to a smaller structure with perhaps lesser cognitive abilities. Given that some types of animals, and in our example today, horned and antlered ruminant mammals, so these are cud-chewing hoof mammals, uh, they have a clearly marked sexual dimorphism, so the males having larger horns or antlers, while females have smaller or none at all. Is there a similar link? Do male ruminants have greater display structures at the expense of smaller, less cognitive brains, while female ruminants retain larger brains as they lack such structures, but have greater cognition, as they might need to be able to assess mate choices more readily? Well, that's a conundrum that Lopez and colleagues wanted to study. The team argued that there was a negative relationship between the size of display and defensive structures and the relative size of the brain. To test this, they sampled a wide swath of ruminant diversity, choosing to focus on three types of structures. So the horns of bovids, that is goats, sheep, and antelopes, as well as cattle, the antlers of cervids, or the true deer, uh, and for added measure, the tusks of musk deer, chevrotains, tuft deer, and Chinese water deer. Now, uh, the latter three are true deer, and, and they also have antlers. But the musk deer belong to a separate clade, the moshids, which are a sister group to the bovids. And the chevrotains are the earliest diverging ruminants alive today. They're their own thing that are sometimes called mouse deer, but again, they're not deer. <laughs> Just vaguely deer-like, if you will. So the team measured the skull length, the length of the horns, antlers, or tusks, and the endocranial volume, or the, the size of the brain within the skull, of the males and females of each species, 29 in all. And so their sample size included uh, the white-tailed and the mule deer, Reindeer, moose, red deer, roe deer, fallow deer, tuft deer. Uh, they had bighorn sheep, blue wildebeest, springbok, topi, jeranook, grant's gazelle, cobs, and reedbuck, as well as surprisingly domestic sheep and goats, <laughs> which is not a bad sample size that yeah. encompasses ruminants from across different ecological zones and morphologies. Um, obviously, a moose is significantly larger than a uh, Chinese water deer, for mm. example, completely different animal almost. The data was then calculated and plotted on a number of 
phylogenetic generalized least squares. And so if you look on the slide here, you can see these displayed in the right of the image here. Now this PGLS uses the evolutionary relationships of the selected organisms and plots the variables accordingly. So it's kind of like a PCA plot. Figure A shows the phylogeny of ruminants and to the right are the PGLS charts. Figure B shows the association between the size of display structures and the brain size of male ruminants. Figure C shows the association between male display structure size and female brain size. And then figure D shows the association between male to female brain energy investment and male to female display structure energy investment. According to the paper, quote, weapon size scales hyperallometrically with body size as estimated by skull size, suggesting that as individuals, male biased, grow larger, they grow disproportionately larger weapons, while brain mass scaled hyperallometrically with body size." End quote. This means that in males, the size of the display structures and the brain grow in size as the body mass grows, yet the structures in particular grow much larger than the brain until they reach a scale that would be out of proportion to the ancestral state. That said, the team did not find evidence that the investment of male ruminants on larger displays had a direct effect on the size of the brain towards smaller size. Though there was one finding that among antlered species, there was some investment on brain size versus the tusked and horned species, which is interesting. Now, the same results held true for females, but when both sexes were compared together, it was noted that there was a positive relationship between the size of the male's display structures and the size of the female's brains. Hmm. Female ruminants directed more energy towards larger cranial capacity as male ruminants directed more energy towards larger display structures. Ergo, their hypothesis that there was a negative relationship between display size and brain size within the male sex did seem to have been validated by the study. And so this is a clear example of sexual dimorphism in ruminant mammals on an internal scale. Hmm. So what do these trade-offs mean for their life histories? Why should this arrangement be? Well, Sexual selection states that individuals will pass on their genes if their display structures secure the mates and combats between members of the same sex. So if, say, a species of deer has a successful arrangement, that mold will be inherited by its offspring. And over time, there may perhaps be a gradual shift in size towards larger and more elaborate displays. Think about the antlers of a moose, for example, or the extinct megaloceros, which is impressive. <laughs> Thus, the males will have invested more energy towards greater displays at the expense of other parts of the body, like the brain. Females, meanwhile, are the ones that choose the males they see fit. But in order to recognize the males with the most effective displays, they would need the brain power to process such information, especially coming from within their social settings. Female ruminants tend to herd together throughout their lives, especially in open habitats like grasslands. It would be advantageous for females to invest energy in a large brain with greater cognition towards that front. And over time, the lineage would see females with larger brains in proportion to males with larger displays. Such are the implications of this study. Now that said, further research would be needed to test this. Uh, for example, to see if the large brains of females are indeed tied to social structures. I could see a similar study incorporating group size data per mm -hmm. female of each species in the study to go towards that front. Now, the paper does end with a brief but more specific discussion on each display type and how they scale with each other. So the tusked ruminants, like the chevrotains and the musk deer, do show similar scaling in skull size between sexes, but the males show higher tusk growth rates and a positive relationship between male body size and tusk size compared to females. Now, the females have regular canines that are much smaller in proportion to the males. In these species, they show the same condition of larger female brains compared to larger male tusks. The horned ruminants, the bovids, are curious because the females can also sport horns of comparable size. Mm -hmm. But these aren't used for sexual displays like males use them. Instead, the females need the horns for defense, both territorial and against predators. So again, another area of study would be whether there's a similar relationship between horns and brain size among females 
in that context. That would be interesting to see. Antlered ruminants, that is the true deer, are also curious in that, save for the reindeer, only the males have antlers. The females don't develop, develop antlers. And in the males, the antlers develop as they grow, but then they are lost seasonally. And this might explain the results that the male deer do invest some energy towards brain size as well as antler size. So again, a third area of study would be to investigate similar data of this type, but among different age ranges of the deer species study. So seeing how juveniles compare to adults, for example. So I think there's a lot of potential here, but for now we have at least a really fascinating start that sheds further light on the evolution of such highly visible sexual dimorphism in deer and antelope and their relatives. So this is a neat paper for a change. Um, I haven't really done a lot of papers on the show looking at kind of like the evolution of brain morphology. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in a sexual dimorphic, dimorphic sense. Um, so I thought this, this was fascinating to, to, to share with you all. Um, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, I think this is fascinating, absolutely. Um, because uh, definitely when it comes to studying, uh, say, display structures, um, there there is often a tendency to uh, in, in research to uh, be very focused on the sex that bears the display structures, which is usually the the males, um, and so often oftentimes it is not considered like you know what kind of effect like strong sexual dimorphism or the presence of um, dimorphic display structures is on the unornamented sex, usually the females. Um, and so to find a relationship like this where increased uh, weapon sexual dimorphism uh, does seem to correlate with uh, kind of an increase in brain size for the, for the females, uh, that, that's an incredibly interesting result for sure. This definitely shines a kind of pretty novel, I would say, perspective on, on this topic. Um, it's definitely, definitely one that you don't normally think about for sure. <laughs> Speaking of interesting display structures, um, if we move on now to your second story, it seems you have some interesting observations about <laughs> proto wings for us. It seems so, yes. Uh, and so this one um, is a bit more familiar territory for me, I guess. Uh, this one has to do with the evolution of birds. What a surprise. Um, but uh, this one um, has to do with the evolution of feathers specifically. And so in recent decades, I would say, we gained a lot of insight on the evolution of feathers, um, thanks in large part to uh, the discovery of feathers um, in fossil uh, non-bird dinosaurs. Um, so it is now very well understood that feathers, in fact, have a very ancient origin in the dinosaur family tree. Uh, exactly how ancient is debated, but we know uh, with pretty high certainty that Feathers originated long before uh, dinosaurs were able to fly. Um, and in fact, uh, the current consensus is that it's not just um, kind of proto feathers that originated uh, prior to flight, um, the kind of more hair like feathers that were probably used for insulation, but even uh, very modern looking feathers um, along the forelimbs and the tail uh, appear to have first appeared in. Uh, dinosaurs that were not able to fly. And so there has been a lot of, um, you know, discussion about how these feathers evolved, like what kind of function might they have served uh, before being uh, adapted for flight purposes. And uh, there have been many, many hypotheses um, put forward to try and explain this. Some are more plausible than others. I guess as a pretty quick rundown of some like the more notable ideas, um, a very popular suggestion is that probably um, having large complex wing feathers along the forelimbs and the tail, um, and I, I guess I should uh, specify here uh, what we mean by these kind of modern looking uh, feathers are feathers that have a central shaft um, and then Along each side of those shafts, there are branches coming off of them, and along each of those main branches coming off of the shaft, there are even smaller branches coming off of them. And at least in modern birds, um, along the tiny branches coming along the big branches, uh, there are even tinier um, 
basically hook-shaped branches that kind of hook into one another and give the feather its overall shape and maintains its shape. Um, so that's a very, very complex structure um, and is, of course, uh, essential for flight in birds today. Uh, but that basic structure seems to have originated in dinosaurs that couldn't fly. Although I would be remiss if I did not add that just this week, as of the time of recording, uh, a new paper came out that argued um, for uh, the origin of flight earlier than we normally assume it to be. Um, basically, uh, a, a paper that came out this week uh, actually suggested that uh, maybe these complex feathers did, did originate with the origin of flight, and in many of the uh, flightless feathered dinosaurs uh, that we find in the fossil record, it may be that they actually evolved from flying ancestors, which is an idea that has been put forward before, but hasn't really been, you know, mainstream. Uh, but it's seen a little bit of a revival uh, in that recent paper this week, so it'll be interesting to, to see how that plays out. But that is not the paper we're talking about today. Um, and in any case, I, I think regardless, um, there are still many plausible explanations for why such feathers might evolve um, in a flightless ancestor prior to the origin of flight. And so one of the popular ideas is that uh, maybe these feathers would, were for display, because um, these feathers, uh, if you grow these big feathers with broad surfaces on your forelimbs and your tail, uh, that gives you like basically a huge display area. You could have all kinds of interesting patterns and shapes on them. Um, that you can use uh, to you know, not only attract mates, but also scare off uh, predators or maybe uh, warn off rivals and so on and so forth. Um, so that's definitely a very popular idea is that uh, these complex feathers first evolved for display purposes. Um, another possibility, and uh, all, all these possibilities are not mutually exclusive. Maybe uh, these early feathered dinosaurs exhibited all kinds of these behaviors and these feathers were useful for many purposes. Um, another possibility is that these feathers were used um, for covering the eggs and the nests of these dinosaurs, and we've discussed this before on the show. Um, basically, in the group of dinosaurs um, that includes modern birds, uh, where we first start seeing uh, evidence of um, basically the parents sitting on the nest to incubate their eggs with their own body heat, um, that's also where we see um, the origins of these complex feathers. Uh, so this is the group Peneraptora, which includes not only birds, but also um, things like Dromaeosaurids, such as Velociraptor and Deinonychus, as well as the Oviraptorosaurs, uh, which we've talked about before on the show, uh, such as Oviraptor. Um, and in many cases, as, as we mentioned before, uh, we have found specimens of Oviraptorosaurs um, sitting on top of their nests and probably like incubating their eggs. Um, whereas in dinosaurs other than Peneraptorans, as far as we can tell, most of them seem to have buried their eggs um, and kind of incubated them with, say, decaying vegetation, or even in some cases there's evidence of them using geothermal heat, so they'll bury their um, eggs near volcanoes. Um, but in Peneraptorans, we start seeing a shift to incubation using body heat instead. And so having these large feathers on the forelimbs and the tail would allow the parent to be able to cover the eggs more effectively and kind of turn themselves into a blanket for the eggs and incubate them with greater efficiency. Uh, so that also seems like a possibility for why uh, they first evolved these large feathers. Um, and uh, another possibility is that the feathers, even though they couldn't be used for flying with, and the, the reason we think that a lot of these early feathered dinosaurs weren't flying with these, with these feathers is that uh, their forelimbs um, and their wing size, if you compare it to the size of the rest of their body, um, are too small for um, to, have, to have kind of been able to lift these dinosaurs into the air. Um, and in many cases, these dinosaurs had, you know, pretty decently sized forelimbs, but um, if you were actually going to make a dinosaur that could actually fly um, with these forelimbs uh, of that body size, then uh, they still fall short of the mark. Uh, even though uh, they couldn't use these uh, wings for flying with, uh, probably they could still assist with locomotion in some ways. Um, like uh, in some flightless birds today, for example, um, do still have like reasonably sized wings. Like ostriches actually have pretty big wings. Um, and one of the ways that they use those wings um, is that, well, ostriches do use their wings for display, but another purpose that they have is uh, to help them maneuver when they're running. Ostriches are very good runners, they're very fast runners. In fact, they are the fastest uh, two-legged animal um, in terms of running speed um, that's alive today. And um, they will actually like kind of flick their wings out to the side um, 
kind of to both maintain their balance or to help them make tighter turns. Uh, and that very well could have been something that these uh, early feathered dinosaurs were doing with their uh, proto wings as well. Um, and there are other possibilities, like maybe helping them uh, jump or like just, you know, basically uh, um, uh, do parkour, essentially. <laughs> I, I've, seen, uh, I've seen people describe this uh, regarding if you if ever actually worked with flightless birds, not, not just birds that are naturally flightless, but also, um, uh, say, captive birds that have had their wings clipped. Um, they're actually still like very agile because they can use their wings to help them like, do all kinds of crazy maneuvers, like running up walls or making like, like quick turns in, uh, around objects and such that can make them pretty difficult to, to handle or capture if you don't know what you're getting into. Um, and so probably a lot of these um, early feathered dinosaurs might have been doing something similar. Um, but in any case, um, those are all possibilities. But uh, this new paper adds another uh, hypothesis to the list. And so this is inspired by the fact that many living birds um, exhibit an interesting foraging behavior. Uh, and this is called flush pursue foraging. And uh, the image on here is kind of small, but in the uh, top uh, left here, the top left corner, you can see a series of photographs, uh, and these are meant to be photographs of living birds uh, performing what is called uh, flush pursue foraging. And so it turns out that some kinds of living birds, especially those that feed on insects, what they'll do is that they will, when they're hunting for insects, they'll suddenly like spread their wing feathers or spread their tail feathers. Um, and oftentimes their wing and tail feathers have like these very bold markings on them. Um, and it seems that this action um, will actually like scare um, insects, um, and so what? Why why might they want to do this? Well, um, basically, one of the main defenses that a lot of insects have is camouflage, right? Um, and if an insect just stays still where it is, uh, where it is well camouflaged, say in the grass or in the leaves or against uh, the soil, um, then it can be very difficult to see. Um, but if the bird can manage to scare the insect into moving, then the bird can detect where the insect is, and then go and pursue it and hopefully capture it. And so this is a, um, a fairly widespread behavior in various insectivorous birds today. And in fact, what the phylogenetic tree, the circular diagram on the top right is showing, is basically um, groups of birds that uh, exhibit uh, flush pursuit behavior. So the pink dots on the ends of the branches are examples of species that perform flush pursuit behaviors. And the blue dots are species that are suspected, but not necessarily confirmed by field observation to do so as well. And so you can see that across the family tree of birds, there are a bunch of different groups that do this. It's a pretty widespread thing. In fact, I have observed this myself um, personally. So if you live in the um, eastern US, you've probably um, seen northern mockingbirds. Uh, they're a very familiar type of bird when I was living in uh, uh, Maryland. Um, and they're quite easy to observe. They're not super skittish of people, um, so you can get fairly close to them. And uh, sometimes I would see them like standing around in the grass. Um, and northern mockingbirds, like they're, they're not super flashy in terms of the coloration. They're mostly a kind of gray colored um, with dark wings. But um, when they open their wings, they have like these two bright patches uh, of white on their wing feathers. And so sometimes I would see them like just kind of s suddenly spread their wings uh, while they're standing in the grass. Um, and one of the functions of this, it is believed, is that they're doing this flush pursuit behavior, trying to scare up uh, insects for them to catch. Um, and uh, another example that I remember seeing um, was uh, one time I was watching an American red start, which is one of the uh, American warblers. Um, and American red starts uh, have these uh, two colored dots on their tail feathers. Um, and so while this uh, American red start was like kind of just moving around the trees, which uh, is a typical foraging behavior of these American warblers, is that they're just constantly moving around in tree branches and uh, kind of looking for insects uh, under leaves and on the branches themselves and uh, trying to catch as many as they can. Um, and what it would do was that it would periodically just kind of spread the tail feather suddenly um, and do this kind of flush pursuit behavior. Um, so that was very interesting to observe. Um, so in any case, uh, this is a, an interesting idea and um, a very interesting concept. And so the authors basically wanted to test whether this kind of strategy would work uh, for kind of the early dinosaurs that first had these complex wing feathers um, as well. And so what they did, and this is pretty interesting, is that uh, they built a robotic model 
of an oviraptorosaur called Caudipteryx, which is one of the oviraptorosaurs where we have direct preservation of the feathers. Uh, so we have a pretty decent idea of like how big its feathers were and how they were arranged on the body. And in fact, um, something I've seen like several news reports about this um, uh, study, uh, but I, I don't think it is often appreciated like how much. Um, uh, detail they actually put into building this robot um, Caudipteryx because they, they really like considered everything like not just the size of the feathers and such but they also considered things like melanosome studies which are you know the pigmentation cells in the feathers which are sometimes preserved um, in these fossils and so the reason that this uh, robot is all painted in black is because melanosome studies indicate that the feathers of Caudipteryx were mostly black, uh, and so they they incorporated that into the uh, the robot. Um, and things like um, basically like what uh, angle um, it would normally hold its uh, its forelimbs at, things like that. Uh, that is also that is also based on like rigorous uh, study as well. And so uh, they incorporate like as much information about um, life appearance of Caudipteryx as uh, basically science and the limitations of building a robot would allow. Um, and so this is a pretty impressive model, I would say, even though it's, of course, necessarily schematic. Um, and so labeled in H here is a photograph of this robot called Diptrix. Um And uh, what they did was that uh, this robot uh, could move its tail and its forelimbs, and it's got like these, uh, you know, models of uh, what the feathers would look like in Caudipteryx on attached to these parts of the body. And so what the authors did was that they um, let the robot approach uh, grasshoppers uh, in the field um, up to various distances and then um, kind of manipulated the, um, the forelimbs of the robot and the tail of the robot to see under what conditions the robot would be able to scare the grasshoppers into, say, jumping away. Um, and... Uh, they also first ran a test to see if like the, the sound of the motor of the robot uh, would scare the grasshoppers and it turns out uh, not more than normal basically like the, the sound of the motor was not really a factor in terms of uh, how easily the grasshoppers would be scared um, so uh, that, that would help them basically narrow down whether or not it was really the, the action of spreading the feathers that was scaring the grasshoppers. Um, and so they tested several different possibilities um, like different arrangements and sizes of the feathers. Um, and basically, uh, the robot was more likely to scare grasshoppers when proto-wings were present on the forelimbs compared to if they weren't. Um, and furthermore, if the feathers were concentrated towards the ends of its forelimbs, so basically the, if they were attached to its hands, um, they would scare them more effectively than if the wings were concentrated only close to the body, and which is quite interesting because um, this is a very common kind of error people make when they're like drawing or making other artistic depictions of these feathered dinosaurs, is that oftentimes they'll leave the hands uh, without feathers, but we know like for a fact like with these fossils that the hands were actually covered with the wing feathers as well which makes sense because that's how it is in modern birds um, and so um, in fact uh, it turns out that having the feathers covering the hands act is actually beneficial um, to scaring insects uh, at least uh, based on the results here um, and it turns out that uh, if uh, they added like complex uh, color patterns on the uh, on the wing feathers, that would also uh, be more effective at scaring grasshoppers, uh, which probably explains why a lot of these uh, flush pursuit birds that do this today um, have bold patterns on their feathers. Um, and finally, um, when feathers were added to the tail, um, and the tail could be like flipped upward to. Uh, be used in display, um, that was also um, something that increased the likelihood of scaring grasshoppers. Um, so basically having both wing and tail feathers uh, is a very effective combination for this flush pursuit strategy. And so with all of this combined, uh, the authors argue that prey flushing behavior um, is a plausible kind of selective advantage uh, for early uh, peneraptorans. Um, and is a potential explanation for why they evolved uh, like these large complex feathers on the wings and tail in the first place. Um, at least it seems to work for a robot that is of the size and shape and general appearance of, uh, of, a, uh, of an early peneraptoran. Um, a lot of these uh, early peneraptorans were relatively small bodied um, uh, animals, like, you know, they not not as small as an average modern bird is, but uh, they were in the size range of say chickens, turkeys, things like that. Uh, so animals that 
conceivably still fed on insects as a uh, as a large part of their diet. Um, and so having this kind of flesh pursuit behavior, um, I would say is uh, not terribly unlikely. Uh, of course, this doesn't demonstrate that this was the reason proto wings uh, and complex feathers first evolved, uh, but I can definitely um, see this as a plausible uh, function for why they had these feathers. Um, so yeah, definitely a very intriguing study. I think a, a very interesting way of testing <laughs> this idea, and uh, it, it is you know always welcome to to get more insight uh, into at least potentially the evolution of these uh, quote unquote key uh, birds traits that are so distinctive in birds today. Um, also, uh, you might notice that the uh, the first author on both of the papers I talked about today has the family name Park, uh, but no, they are not the same person. That's just a coincidence. So uh, it's a funny one, though. <laughs> so uh, what do you think about this? That's another great paper. I um, I kind of like seeing the testing of, of this kind of new hypothesis mm -hmm. because when reading about like the great evolutionary transitions or just evolution in general, one of the things you learn is that oftentimes there are multiple functions for an organ or a part of the body yeah. that is then later incorporated into new behaviors. Yep. And so to me, it makes a lot of sense that this is a, like this could be a potential aspect of proto wings for these, you know, these these types of dinosaurs, where they're being used for display and flushing out prey or you know, covering the nest, and then later um, being incorporated into, you know, powered flight as the rest of the body changed in suit. So it's, it's a neat idea for sure. I, I think, like as a behavior, it makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. particularly like if there's some data here that suggests that it, it works on large sized animals. Um, I, I do love the robot though. Yeah, I'm seeing the, the the image of it here. Right, it's like it's on like a little Segway. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Cotyptrix is an interesting one because like that, yeah, that's one where we we definitely have like impressions of like the feathers yeah. mm -hmm. on the fossils, like in terms of like the full wing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in terms of like picking a dinosaur to use, this is a great example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very fascinating paper indeed. I know we, we've featured a number of papers like this before, but I always love seeing like the construction of like models and robots and, and like test dummies yeah. to, yeah. to mm -hmm. test ideas in natural history yeah, like yeah. this. What a great strategy. <laughs> I love it. So I think we'll shift gears to our last study. Mm -hmm. This is my uh, second paper for this month. Um, this is a little bit different. Uh, this concerns an ecological study by Douglas N. Kamaru and colleagues, which highlights the role that invasive species can play in a new environment. So one of the most important aspects of the science of ecology is mutualism, the symbiotic relationship between organisms where benefits are received by all of them. We see examples of this everywhere, sharks and remoras to pollinating insects and flowering plants to the very biology of corals and lichens. The natural world is stuffed with mutualistic relationships and many ecosystems would be irrecoverably distorted or damaged should any of these ties be severed. And that would be especially true if the mutualisms occurred between keystone or foundational species in the ecosystem, the very bottom that underpins the entire system. Studies demonstrating the effects of severed mutualisms are many but those showing such distortions at foundational levels are few and far between. So this paper by Kamaru et al. is very important. It's been able to highlight one such incident that had reverberations across the entire landscape and across clades. Mm. So in Kenya, East Africa, one of these foundational mutualisms is between the whistling thorn acacia tree or Vachelia drepanolobium and the acacia ants of the genus Chromatogaster. The ants feast on the flower nectar of the trees, and the tree provides this along with shelter in the form of these bulbous thorny spines that as the ants chew holes to enter and exit the tree, the wind blows through these and it creates whistling sounds, hence the name. 
<laughs> in return for all of this, the ants act in the tree's defense, using venomous stings to attack anything and everything, <laughs> wasps to elephants, and keeping them from destroying the trees through their foraging. In recent times, there's been a new ant species on the block. This is the big-headed ant, uh, Fatale megacephala, uh, which is from the islands in the Indian Ocean, probably in or near Mauritius. These ants have been introduced across the world, including the U.S. and Australia. But in Kenya, they've been known to be especially lethal to these acacia ant and thorn tree mutualisms. When a swarm of these finds a tree, they completely overtake the acacia ant colony and kill all the individuals, young and old. But they don't take up residence in the bulbous thorns. These ants nest underground. And so now the tree has no defenses anymore from overbrowsing. This allows elephants and other herbivores to quickly eat up the trees and break them down, uh, according to the paper, at seven times the rate of undisturbed areas. Mm -hmm. And it's estimated that the ants have been moving at a pace of 50 meters a year across this landscape, giving more opportunity to sever more mutualisms. <laughs> Surely such an effect must ripple through the landscape in many ways. And the team in particular were curious about the effects on lions and zebras. In brief, zebras make up a large proportion of the grazing animals in this region of Kenya. And high acacia tree growth would provide cover for lions on their ambush hunts. So if there were less trees around, zebras would have an easier chance of spotting lions before they strike. Big-headed ants, leaving trees vulnerable to elephants, creating more open habitat for zebras, would thus be something that could be tested by the researchers. First, the team measured differences in visibility throughout the region, specifically in these special blocks that they set up of about 2,500 meters squared around places where big-headed ants have invaded, as well as in undisturbed groups, control groups where elephants and other giant herbivores like giraffes and rhinos would be fenced off to keep them that way. Next, the team studied the behavioral aspects of each of the relevant animals. So the presence of the big headed ants, the density of the zebra herds and the activity of the lions and how many zebras they were able to kill. These observations and measurements took place over a period of three years. And as an added measure, the team set up 21 nested path analyses to see whether the big-headed ants could affect lions and zebras and to what extent. So uh, a nested path analysis looks at the multiple pathways that could occur when a series of variables acts on the outcome choice. In this case, whether lions can make kills of zebra or not. The variables consisted of different measurements, including visibility due to tree loss, big ant, uh, big-headed ant occurrence, density of zebra herds, and so on. And so let's move to the next slide, and we can see the results of this. Mm -hmm. Of the 21 nested path analyses, 14 were statistically viable and matched the observed data from the field plots. Indeed, from this combination of field measurements and statistics, the team was able to confirm, indeed, that the presence of big-headed ants and their severing of acacia protection led to a reduction in zebra kills by lions in this region of Kenya hmm. because the zebras had greater visibility of the lions in the landscape. Uh, in areas that were not invaded by big-headed ants, zebras were 2.87 times more likely to be successfully hunted. You know, small but not insignificant. So here was clear evidence then of what you could call an ecological cascade. The invasive big-headed ants were killing acacia ants and ending the mutualistic relationship with the acacia trees, leaving them vulnerable to plant predators like elephants, who then mowed down the trees and created more open spaces, which allowed the zebras to better make out lions in the region and reduce their risk of hunts. So what happens to the lions then? Well, for one, the lions probably aren't deprived of all their food, as again, they may still be able to catch zebras every now and then just not as successfully as they did before. The team hypothesizes that lion prides would compensate for this by shifting their ambush behaviors towards specifically uninvaded areas, and so increasing their chances of successful hunts that way. Or 
it's possible that lions would shift their preferred prey choice to something else. And the paper highlights Cape Buffalo in particular. Mm. And in fact, we have evidence to suggest that in the period from 2003 to 2020, in this region, lions decreased zebra hunts from 67 to 42 percent, while buffalo hunts increased from zero to 42 percent, despite a lack of evidence for density changes in zebras or buffalo. So in, in all the time that the big-headed ants were affecting these trees, the amount of zebras in the landscape did not change. But either way, there was a discernible link then between the big-headed ants and the lions themselves. So what you would call this redirected tropic flow of organismal relationships in Kenya, I think underscores the necessity for better landscape management. Mm. While the discourse on invasive species is big and often pointed at times, here at least we have clear evidence that an invasive species, in this case the big-headed ant, can have rippling effects across an entire landscape. Granted, the ecosystem is not totally destroyed, but now its relationships are all shifted and new, relatively speaking. The suggested change from lions hunting zebras to lions hunting more buffalo would require behavioral changes on the part of the lions. As evidence shows, male lions will participate more often in buffalo hunts, and more lions would be needed for successful buffalo hunts, given the size and strength of those animals. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing. This is all rather new. And we lack long-term data to suggest that this ecological cascade would end up sustaining itself in the long run. You know, the gradual loss of the primary prey species of zebras by lions and their potential replacement by buffaloes might only be temporary. And there may be other factors in the loss of acacia tree and ant mutualisms that we have yet to fully understand. Given that the big-headed ants are invasives, that means the responsibility for the potential futures of this ecosystem, and other ecosystems in particular, would ultimately be placed on us, because we were the ones who introduced the ants in the first place. So I thought that, as far as ecological studies go, this was particularly big. Mm -hmm. you know, there's been a lot of discussion about invasive species in certain parts of the world, you know, Florida Everglades, for example, um, and what the effect of, say, released reptiles like pythons might be doing to those ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So to see a paper like this, where we have like numerical data and observational data combined that shows definite links between the introduction of these ants and all the changes that ripple through the ecosystem to the point where ants are affecting lions, even if those organisms are not interacting with each other. That's pretty significant. And so I really wanted to share this paper to highlight that. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, buddy. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty amazing, I would say. <laughs> yeah, uh, like I, I know when I first came across this paper, I, I definitely did think, oh, this would be worth covering on the show. And I, I know you thought pretty much the same thing when you saw it. So, um, yes, uh, this this is a really interesting um, study, I feel. Um, when you're interested in, you know, natural history, um, you understand this concept, right? That ecosystems are very intricately interlinked and everything depends on every other thing and so on. And uh, just changing one element of the ecosystem can send a whole cascading effect uh, down, uh, you know, through the rest of it um, and create like very uh, dramatic consequences. But to see a really concrete example of this, it's, uh, it, it's really striking. It's, uh, it really leaves an impression. And it really goes to show that this kind of, these kinds of effects aren't always what you would expect, right? Like, just a uh, from a purely intuitive standpoint, like uh, how how does how does introducing a, a new species of ant affect the prey choice of lions? Like that, that's not those just aren't things that you would expect to be directly correlated. But um, yet here we are, and we can also trace the actual sequence of events that led up to it. It's uh, yeah, like like you said, this is a pretty big deal. It's uh, it really is. Uh, good to get like a, you know, a very clear example of something like this happening. I like it a lot. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. 
And I mean, it really, it's almost like playing with fire in right. a sense, <laughs> when you mess with, with this sort of stuff. Like, this paper only highlighted the effects on lions mm -hmm. and zebras, right. right? Right. But there's that undercurrent in the background of like, well, these elephants and other large herbivores, like they mentioned giraffes and rhinos, are more likely to eat and mow down these acacia trees because mm. they're not having to worry about ants stinging them in the mouth. <laughs> right. Um, but it's like, what happens, like what are the possibilities that it gets to a point where they overgraze? They're eating way too many acacia trees. Mm. Other organisms are probably relying on the acacia trees in the landscape to an extent. Um, and so what about that? You know, how how is this going to affect the elephants in the long run? Right. Certainly since they're, they're so good at, at, at you know, overgrazing trees, that's one of the big things about the African elephant in particular. It, it's a keystone species in that when they live in, in open savannas, they end up keeping them open because they prevent trees from growing too much. Um, and then this is an environment here where I guess like the natural or the baseline condition is to have you know heavily forested areas of acacia tree. That's completely changed now mm. with, with the introduction of these ants and their effects on the elephants. So, yeah, it's just we there, there's things that we probably are not quantifying, or we really should quantify to see whether this will cascade even more, like for right. better or for worse. Because um, I mean, it, it is true that at the end of the day, when given the opportunity and faced with new challenges, organisms can adapt to an extent. Right. Um, but this tends to happen over long periods of time, and it's not always beneficial for every organism mm. at all, because clearly the native acacia ants are the ones that are suffering yep. the biggest, because these big-headed ants will just massacre their colonies, <laughs> and then where are they going to go? It's... um. It's just there's so many things to think about it. It drives me nuts that it, it's gotten to this point. Mm -hmm. And so I I really want to like see further research in this area and like what what are the stakes involved and like what could be done? Yeah. You know, how do you how do you remove an invasive ant? Mm -hmm. Especially one that nests underground. Yeah. It, it's a it's often easier said than done and a lot of times attempts to remove invasive species have just led to more invasive species <laughs> right. made yeah. look at hawaii for example <laughs> right um, it is crazy um so i'm really i'm really glad to see this and i hope the data goes towards important conservation work in this mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. to kind of ensure that things don't go too off the rails and, and maybe we can try to restore this ecosystem back to its original function yeah. before things get worse it's always frustrating. You, why do things have to get worse before they get better? <laughs> yeah. Why don't you just like not make things worse to begin with? <laughs> right. <laughs> Certainly make things easier for everyone, including the organisms. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that is it for our stories today. Um, definitely want to thank you all for joining us, and uh, we definitely look forward to providing more new stories down the road. Um, but for now, let's go ahead and jump to our usual acknowledgements. So we are on Patreon. We are patreon.com forward slash time clays. And there we regularly post previews of upcoming episodes. So if you're of a certain tier, and usually that's the, the highest tier, you will get to see all of the stories that we cover ahead of time. And you might even get a chance to ask questions that we could answer on the show for y'all. So if you're interested in joining for any monetary donation, that's patreon.com forward slash time and clades. Any contributions you bring would help us continue the series and develop new projects and expansions. Um, and if you're of a certain tier, you can get a shout out on our show. So we have a couple people that we want to highlight. I want to thank my sister Julie and our friends Paul, Denver, Tristan, Frankish, and Val Nunzio for their contributions. Thank you so much. Your name could be on there too if you're interested. <laughs> so consider thinking about it. Um, in terms of our uh, regular acknowledgments, of course, we want to thank good friends Henry and Alicia for their contributions to the series. 
Henry is responsible for the wonderful theme music that opens each episode. And Alicia is responsible for the color scheme of Albert's Albrisor avatar. Cheerful little fellow. <laughs> um, of course, we are still on Twitter, at <laughs> Time and Clades, where we usually just upload episodes as they air. But most likely, if we're watching us on YouTube, that's through Time and Clades. So if you're interested in liking and subscribing to get updates on our episodes, we always appreciate that. And if you have any questions at all about the papers that we've talked about today, or just anything in general, there are three ways to reach us. Email us, timeandclades at gmail.com. You can leave us a, a comment on our YouTube uh, page, um, or you could tweet at us, and we will almost certainly get to that and respond in kind. Now, of course, if you're interested in reading or checking out the papers that we've talked about today, we do put uh, the references as links in the description for you to check out. Uh, and of course, we'll go ahead and put um, links to uh, Attenborough and the Jurassic Sea Monastery and Montefiore's The World if you want to check out what I was checking out recently. <laughs> um, and with that, that is the end of Through Time and Clades for today. Thank you all again for joining us. Um, in terms of updates, we will probably be continuing our usual new schedule. I am currently working on Humanity of Prologue Season 2, sickness uh, notwithstanding. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm hoping for an early release date at some point this year. Maybe in the next month, maybe the month after that. It's going to be soon. But I'm definitely excited to be working on a lecture series again. And mm -hmm. I hope to provide some wonderful information and some philosophical thought processes for everyone who wants to follow along. Um, Albert, is there anything you want to end off with? Uh, yeah, I don't think I have much to add to that. Uh, so yeah, we will see you next time, um, probably on the next news episode, but you know, we're full of surprises, so who knows? Um, in the meantime, uh, I hope everybody has a very good one and take care everyone. <laughs> Take care, everybody.